presently he is heading uh, at profit mart research advisory desk and apart from that he runs a very good mentorship uh, fundamental mentorship program which can be checked out at avinashmentor.com so with this i would uh, request uh, avinash ji uh, if he would uh, like to tell more about himself and uh, then we will proceed with the yeah i think uh, uh, good evening uh, you know uh, uh, you know everybody and thank you for attending this uh, twitter uh, space podcast uh in fact uh, my introduction has already been given uh, you know just to add uh, i have been on the fundamental side since 1992 and till date i have been covering you know many sectors many companies so my job is uh, very interesting in fact uh, you know the interest in my job only keeps me uh, you know uh, you know working hard in this area because today uh, we are seeing many important you know new companies coming to the capital market some new sectors getting introduced to investor so it's always a learning experience to know what is the company's business model uh, what is the management bandwidth and i think uh, very frankly uh, you know data points which come uh, you know from the company side in terms of their balance sheet in terms of their cash flows uh, it, you know every number tells a story to the investor and i think we need to understand that very clearly so data is very important and secondly on the qualitative side you know i make it a habit to actually visit companies uh, you know talk to companies on virtual meets or either personal meetings because that is also one important parameter when you look at fundamental research so today a lot of data is available on twitter you know on you know linkedin or typically on whatsapp groups telegram channels but i think what is important is that you require authenticity of that data because today you cannot uh, just use secondary data to take any investment call so you know i i would definitely make a very uh, you know strong effort to ensure that everybody's questions today in the q and a session are going to be answered but before that you know uh, i would like to you know give a small backdrop as to why which sectors are important which are going to do well and what are the kind of key you know data points as far as india is concerned because you know if you look at our country i think india is a country where you're going to see phenomenal growth for the next 10 20 years and uh, before that uh, you know after that of course we'll take all the sectors which i like and of course sectors which are to be avoided also because uh, it goes without saying that you know what you should not do is even more important than what you should do so i think uh, i have given my introduction and the flow in which i would begin so uh, you can tell me when we can start yeah that's great so ravi uh, would you like to start with the questions then we move on to no i guess uh, avinash ji had started on a very right flow Uh, first thing everyone uh, would like to know what are the good sectors for next 20 years few sectors which uh, he can talk in detail and what are the things to avoid uh, i think that uh, would be the best thing to start off with sir over to you yeah okay i think ravi thank you that thank you uh, for that uh, so friends uh, you know first of all uh, a very simple uh, thing in the markets which i have learned the hard way is that creating wealth in the markets you know from equity investment is not a easy job Uh, we normally see television channels we see a lot of experts come on channels and feel that it's a very easy job to make money it is not and uh, you know time uh, alone is going to actually train all of us you know how many times we fall down and get up so making wealth in the markets will only be possible as long as you love the journey of remaining invested in equity markets for the longer term and only when you have a strong level of conviction is when you know actually wealth creation happens for you at an individual level so you should not get frustrated Uh, if you find that stocks are not working out for you in the very short term because equity is a long term asset class secondly now coming straight away to the valuations of the market the broad market according to me looks very attractive because uh, despite the fact that you know after the covid pandemic uh, this year started with a very uh, bad note the russia ukraine war started uh, then we had inflation fears commodity prices went up but uh, just to tell you what are the key you know pre multiples which are currently prevailing for the nifty 50 i think the current uh, valuation multiple is around 19 uh, to 20 times based on one year forward earnings and if you look at uh, you know the december 2019 uh, kind of multiple for nifty 50 it was almost 28 times so we are still below that peak pe multiple uh, as far as uh, you know the nifty mid cap 100 is concerned uh, we did a little uh, research there also there also we found that the p multiple in december 2019 was almost 25 26 times currently it is about 21 times so clearly you know i don't think markets are in a overblown bubble kind of territory so there's obviously going to be a pick and choose approach which has got to be followed but again on a broader index level i think markets definitely look to be fairly uh, you know uh, you know reasonably valued 
uh for the country as a whole i think the key triggers which we are seeing in the last few months is first is you know our gdp forecast this year is going to be very solid compared to all the developing countries the developed world uh, you know our gdp would be about 8% for uh, 22 23 and the gst collection has been improving and going from strength to strength now this is a very important variable for all of us who track corporates i think gst numbers for april 22 have touched a all time record high of almost 167000 plus crores and most importantly bank credit you know which was you know roughly in the range of 4 to 5% in 2021 has improved to almost 10% in fy22 now this is a clear signal that you know credit growth is picking up and this is probably a very good time for banking as well as for you know housing finance companies and for all the financials basically which we'll talk later in the session today uh, most importantly you know exports have also risen we have seen a very strong growth in exports Uh, in the month of april 22 so that gives me comfort that you know the economy is on the right footing despite the fact that inflation has increased you know commodity prices have gone up and most importantly now india is a market which we cannot i mean the global investors cannot ignore of course fis have been selling quite significantly but on the global footprint i think you know things like jandhan or for that reason upi aadhar or maybe the vaccination program which took place post covid i think has been one of the biggest achievements for india you know which places us on a very strong competitive footing in the global markets uh, our belief is that you know sector themes uh, which will be really important going forward will revolve around three four you know key parameters which i normally look in companies and basically first is the demography second is the deleveraging and third is the digitization now these are three themes which are going to play out uh, very strongly over the next 5 to 10 years uh, demography has already been understood uh deleveraging is one area where i think lot of effort has gone by corporates in reducing you know debt on the corporate balance sheets and obviously digitization is here to stay you know after covid what we have seen is that digitization has actually taken off in a significant manner and most importantly you know in short i would like to say that you know roti kapda makan dawai dawai and suraksha you know these are you know themes which are not going to go out of fashion they are always going to uh, give you decent amount of risk rewards in all uh, you know markets especially in volatile markets like now so now coming to the sectors uh, without uh, wasting time now the first sector which i like and where we have been advising uh, some of our clients as well as you know telling some of our friends is that is basically the agri input kind of uh, sector basically sectors covering fertilizers seeds agrochemicals now the reason why we have been uh, you know talking about this sector in media as well as doing our own research is that we feel that you know due to the russia ukraine war you know geopolitically conditions are very bad for the food grain you know kind of scenario in fact uh, we could see a huge food grain crisis emerging not only uh, you know abroad especially where you know obviously country like ukraine and russia is concerned but this is going to actually help you know companies which are going to uh, get involved in the manufacture of food grain so obviously companies which are into fertilizers into seeds in pesticide and which have got a decent export market share will obviously benefit significantly and uh, secondly i think uh, a recent news report which i read just a couple of days back was that you know the bank of Gov- uh, england governor has said that you know there's a very big uh, kind of a food shortage looming you know for countries like ukraine russia and the european markets ukraine is a very large supplier of wheat in fact uh, you know it's among the top 5 global exporters for many uh, agriculture products like corn wheat barley so you know this is going to create a lot of uh, issue as far as the food supply in the country uh, in these countries is concerned so typically agri related companies is you know companies like say a sharda crop chem or maybe a united phosphorus or typically even a rallies i would believe that uh, one has to of course do a pick and choose here but there are many companies which have got a good export kind of uh, market abroad and this is definitely going to help these companies uh, the second sector which i think is going to remain very strong in the near term at least for the next 3 to 4 years is the defense sector now defense sector is a very large domestic market opportunity uh, clearly it's a make in india initiative mr modi has put in a lot of efforts and now we are seeing that almost every defense company has got a order book of at least 2 to 3 years uh, we have seen very tepid results you know for companies like bharat electronics or for that reason bharat dynamics hcl but uh, typically these companies operate you know uh, in basically in you know in not in uh, a secular kind of growth patterns their growth is typically lumpy so you know in one quarter you could see profits in the second quarter you could find the profits are flat but what is important is that you are going to see a lot of action in several defense companies because lot of new defense items are now uh been privatized a lot of private sector companies are now going to be given preference over the foreign companies so here i think this is one space where any weakness in the market if it comes at all i think one should use it as a good opportunity to accumulate these companies you know if one has a long term view and uh, 
the third sector which is very important which is not uh, you know company specific but uh, so, uh, you know it is basically for those companies which actually manufacture import substitute products now we know there are many many import substitute products which are still imported because those products are not manufactured in india now if you look at uh, you know uh, products like phenol acetone titanium dioxide or for that reason tcca or epichlorohydrin you know these are products which are made by a handful of indian companies and these companies are going to benefit significantly because obviously being a import substitute gives them a decent amount of uh, you know kind of margin kind of protection at the same time demand is quite uh, strong so obviously over the next say, three to four years our sense is that you know companies which are into these kind of import substitute products and where there is no local competition you are going to see a lot of uh, you know growth for these companies so typically focus on import substitute products and where largely the product is either you know made uh, for domestic markets or even exported to you know some asian or european markets and uh, typical examples could be you know a make money fine chem who's going to make uh, basically epichlorohydrin then uh, titanium dioxide again which is used in the paint plastic sector in a big way almost 80% of that product is imported in india and where make money organics is setting up a large capacity uh, as far as phenol acetone is concerned you know deepak nitrate continues to enjoy a very good margin advantage over the global uh, you know kind of peers and as far as tcca is concerned i think bodal chemicals is a very important player here it's the only player in the uh, in india and globally also it's one of the few players which is now making tcca which has also got a very immense kind of potential so import substitute team will continue to do well according to me in the next say 2 to 3 years and then we come to an, another interesting uh, you know segment which is shipping and logistics now recently we have seen a lot of fourth quarter numbers coming out and i was pleasantly surprised that you know we saw very strong numbers from a lot of logistic companies companies like uh, you know typically al cargo tci express or for that reason shreya shipping lancer containers now these companies have benefited largely because manufacturing sector has taken off in a very big way uh, there has been a strong uptake in global demand there has been a rise in exports imports and this has actually helped the volume growth kick in very strongly so typically logistics is one space which had underperformed for a long time but uh frankly now looking at the numbers i feel that you know there's a lot of steam left in these companies as far as the earnings growth is concerned and if the economy grows by uh, 7 8% for the next say 2 to 3 years uh, i would be reasonably sure that you know these companies would definitely deliver very strong returns going forward uh the next sector is power generation power distribution and even power platform companies you know here the bigger story is that uh, the power generation companies are going to obviously do well because power consumption levels have gone up power tariffs have also started you know going up in fact there have been some concerted government support you know for increasing the tariff so you know traditional power generators like ntpc tata power torrent power uh, you know other green players renewable energy players would also do well but i think companies like tata power which is planning a strategic move to you know electric vehicle infrastructure solar i think this is one area where you know if one takes a 2 to 3 year call then i think there's going to be a lot of growth here Uh, as far as platform companies like uh, you know iex are concerned you know power financing companies like rec are concerned i would believe that you know these balance sheets of these companies are extremely uh, strong uh, despite the fact that there could be some sort of underperformance in the short term longer term i think uh, you know investors will definitely make money so you know we are positive on this uh, sector also and then finally uh, you know coming to the last two three sectors first is you know uh, we are bullish on all the export oriented sectors which actually uh you know are earning dollars for themselves because a weak rupee and a rising dollar is a excellent combination for such kind of sectors especially you know companies from the it space from the pharmaceutical space from the auto component space from the textile space so these are all ancillary sectors which are you know export focused and obviously a weak uh, rupee and a strong dollar is going to actually benefit them in terms of margins uh, most importantly here within the it pack you know just today i uh was reading some article where you know uh, prime minister modi has actually inaugurated the bharat drone mahotsav today and this was the first day where almost 200 drone manufacturers have displayed their products so within the it space i think now all of us have to keep a very close watch on the drone companies you know which are going to make drones as the government is very very clear that they see a lot of scope for these companies going forward in fact uh, the government has very clearly mentioned you know from mr modi's speech which i heard today Uh, that the agriculture sector the defense sector and the disaster management areas are going to be areas where possibly in the next 2 to 3 years we are going to see a lot of usage of these drones so typically you know in the capital markets there are few companies which are definitely going to benefit here uh, you know some of them are small some of them are large but the point which is very important is that this is a space which is now going to be on the radar of many investment managers 
the drone policy will also help uh, use drone in some b2b segments like usr maybe e-commerce or maybe you know for some logistic companies for you know delivering products and you know over nearby locations so i think the opportunity is huge but the bigger trigger will be used in defense and agriculture which the government wants to push aggressively so i think you know the ground has been very clearly uh, very well laid the pitch has been developed now by the government now it's up to the private sector and obviously the listed companies which have the technology the skill can definitely expect to get huge order wins over the next say 2 to 3 years now typically uh, year again to add from the it space you know i have been telling this on media quite regularly that within it we like saas companies software as a service companies and there are few companies which are listed unfortunately a large number of you know saas companies are still owned by the private private equity companies but there are two three companies which are listed you know operating in the banking in the treasury in the insurance space there are some companies which are operating only in the hospitality and the hotel management space you know these are companies where i think all of you should keep them on the radar because this space itself is going to see explosive growth over the next say you know 5 to 10 years uh then we come to basically local you know sectors like ethanol now ethanol is one subject which has been talked quite extensively but even today uh, we find that uh, you know stocks in this sector are fairly undervalued in fact uh, not only the larger players but even the smaller players i think ethanol is one uh, input which is going to get significant upside over the next say 2 to 3 years because the government is very keen that crude oil imports come down A, a, a large part of the crude oil is substituted by blending and already the blending ratio has been put at around 20% by fy25 so this is a definitely a very big uh, upscaling opportunity for the existing players uh, our sense is that you know government will not backtrack on this as you know earlier was the case because the government has realized that now uh, ethanol manufacturing is going to give be given a very high kind of focus so typically you know companies which have got ready capacity are definitely going to make the most of it initially uh, we have found that even psu players now like gale has also decided to set up ethanol plant so clearly demand is insufficient and supply is very limited so i think in that perspective even ethanol uh, you know selectively can be an area where you know investors can even look at these stocks at the current levels uh, provided you know their time frame is slightly longer term in mind and then finally you know we come to the core uh, frontline sectors of the market which are very important and that is banking and financial now a strong credit growth cycle is definitely going to benefit the banks both the private sector as well as the psu banks housing finance companies non banking finance companies and lot of private sector you know small size banks which cater to the msb and the sme segment now fortunately interest rate cycle has also started moving up so it may be bad news for the borrower but good news for these banks because typically when the interest rate cycle takes off it remains you know in action for at least the next 2 to 3 years and normally the asset quality during a rising interest rate cycle is the least so that is something also which the market should like and i think investors could definitely pick and choose you know not only from the large cap uh, psu but the large cap private sector banks but there are a lot of private sector banks in the mid cap category space where you know one needs to do a little bit of research before one uh, targets any specific company but broadly we are positive on the large cap bank because these are very solid banks with very strong balance sheets a very large kind of loan book uh, portfolio and where the risk management is extremely solid where the management bandwidth is also very you know strong so these uh, you know points make the larger banks especially you know from the psu and the private sector banks quite attractive and finally uh, you know just to uh, end the session before we take up questions i think uh, we are also positive on domestic consumption themes you know typically qsr companies you know we have seen that these companies have now started delivering top line growth of 25 30 35 odd percent then obviously you know manufacturing sector which includes the capital goods sector of the construction and the building product sector is also one area where possibly lot of growth could kick in uh, telecom which is a traditionally dominated sector by just two or three players is continuously seeing increase in the arpus and i think this is obviously because of the rise in the internet and value added services so i think this is also one space where one could see not only the frontline telecom sector but even ancillary companies you know which cater to the telecom sector should benefit significantly and uh, obviously you know companies like lasan and tubro thermax you know these are large capital goods players so one can definitely keep these companies on the radar and most importantly you know construction companies you know which were languishing even before the covid uh, we have seen lot of improvement in their order book you know companies you know which are like sadbhav or maybe for that reason a psp project Uh, numbers for psp project just came in today so you know on all parameters these companies seem to be doing pretty well so typically in a rising kind of uh, you know uh, economic recovery kind of cycle uh, if the gdp grows if the manufacturing sector grows obviously these companies are going to benefit and finally uh, 
please also look at you know companies which have got a lot of cash on their books which have got very strong operating cash flow this is the best time to look at quality companies you know which are languishing because of poor market sentiment and uh, obviously that is going to make a lot of money for all of us because data is very important uh, i mean uh, narrative is important but more than the narrative according to me it is the data point which the company generates which is going to make the stock re rate going forward and just to conclude uh, you know uh, what are the kind of sectors i would avoid at least as of now you know maybe not for the next 5 years but at least for the next 12 to 15 months uh, the first sector i would be avoiding is metals i think metals is clearly on a Uh, kind of a downtrend i think uh, despite the fact that we have seen very good numbers in the fourth quarter the outlook on metal prices is little uncertain i think we have been talking to many steel companies and uh, the one answer which we have got from metal companies you know from the promoters from the directors is that steel prices are not going up inflation has started affecting demand and that is something which is a little scary picture because if at all the prices correct sharply then the fall from year on can be even more bad and i think one can expect uh, you know maybe the second third quarter Uh, you know, of FY twenty three to show the full impact of this downfall. Uh, the second sector which we are not very comfortable in terms of valuations is aviation. Despite the fact that it is an unlocking story, uh, we believe that unless you know companies here record decent cash flows, crude prices don't come off, and obviously you know balance sheets don't improve, I think aviation is going to be largely be a trading kind of bet and not a wealth creation sector. The third sector is paints. You know, paints has seen a lot of action of late. You know, after the announcement of. very large corporates decided to enter the market i mean grassim has announced a very large uh, entry in the paint market jsw has already entered the market and i think this has already got impacted on majors like asian paints berger kansai so our sense is that you know valuations in the paint sector are very richly valued uh, there is no margin of error here and if you go wrong you can go wrong completely badly uh, one aspect is the crude oil price which is of course something which all paint companies face but the more important thing is that if grassim has entered the market it's obviously a very dominant player in the cement in the building product space and therefore in the next one or two years uh, one is bound to see some margin pressure coming in despite the fact that you know one can reasonably say that dominance of asian paint berger paint could still continue then we come to uh, fmcg sector i think fmcg as a pack definitely is now a little more vulnerable considering the kind of cost inflation kind of uh, you know moves which we have seen in the market almost every fmcg companies has reported raw material cost inflation and it is unlikely that this raw material cost inflation will go away in a short time so i think as of now i would be little uh, you know uh, you know uh, little careful on putting my money on a britannia or maybe on a giver or for that reason even on a marico i think these are all you know segments which could face a little bit of pricing uh, power pressure because obviously when uh, you know raw material prices are increasing it is unlikely that they could go in for very sharp price in and then finally uh, you know uh, the oil marketing companies which a lot of guys have been telling me that fourth quarter has been very good uh, largely they that has been good because of inventory profits you know these companies benefited because of the you know older crude which they had in their inventory but if you look at the crude price uh, post january i think uh, one thing is very clear that uh, my sense is that april to june may be a very challenging quarter and i think that is the reason we have seen stocks like ioc bpcl hpcl despite very strong numbers you know the stocks have more or less flattened out so i think outlook there will depend on how quickly crude prices correct uh, depending on how the russia ukraine war culminates and gets over and finally uh, you know my uh, thinking is that the last sector which one should avoid is basically the new internet you know companies companies like paytm or for that reason zomato uh, you know policy bazaar these are all companies where businesses are great uh, the business will definitely survive in the longer term but valuation still uh, don't leave that kind of comfort for the investors in fact uh, you know if we look at all the losses of all these companies Uh, my sense is that you know most of the investors have burnt their hands very badly and i think it would be at least be a couple of years before really value could emerge in this space so you know despite the fact that the opportunity is very large the business model is good uh, the valuations for retail investors is probably not the right valuation you know as of today so friends i think this is what uh, you know briefly i want to touch upon i think we can take now question answer session and whatever you know company related or sector related queries uh, all of you have got i would love to answer them that was really like you covered all the sectors major sectors and it was really interesting on your part avinash thanks for that i have uh, one two small questions and then uh, we will uh, ask uh, sashank uh, if he have any query from the perhaps chemical pharma question and then we will ask the audiences to come up 
अविनाश लाइक विद द फॉर्मलाइजेशन ऑफ इकोनॉमी वी आर सोइंग टू शो आई मीन इन वेरियस सेक्टर्स द ऑन अन द शेयर ऑफ द अनऑर्गेनाइज्ड प्लेयर्स आर मूविंग ऑन टू ऑर्गेनाइज्ड प्लेयर्स सो आई वांट टू नो योर व्यू ऑन दिस थिंग एंड द पीएलआई स्कीम व्हिच गवर्नमेंट इज वेरी वोकल अबाउट सो गोइंग फॉरवर्ड हाउ यू सी इट विल इंपैक्ट वेरियस सेक्टर्स एंड या प्लीज या आई थिंक एज फार एज द unorganized share uh, you know reducing and getting converged with the organized sector i think that is a trend which started with the gst you know now gst have become a very dominant kind of revenue uh, kind of force for the government and i think as and how you know gst numbers increase uh, what is happening is in many sectors where unorganized sector was a very large component that is going to obviously reduce significantly and that is going to give a lot of market share expansion for existing players you know peer, there were a lot of companies in the plywood sector which were unorganized now things are getting better there uh, for that reason even within the pharma sector or maybe for the auto component sector or for maybe even the uh, consumer durable sector there were a lot of unorganized uh, unbranded kind of products sold in the market so i think uh, you know in india this is definitely going to be a very strong team which is going to obviously benefit the organized sector in a significant way uh, as far as as far as pli schemes are concerned i would believe that on ground you know we have been talking to many corporates Uh, the policy is good but you know corporates are still a little uncertain and a little cautious in committing money you know in a very large way uh, for example you know we met managements from amara raja we met managements from excite i think very clearly these companies are looking at big investments in the you know electric vehicle battery or maybe the lithium battery segment but as of now i think things on ground look to be a pretty slow but yes if you took a look at it from the next 3 to 4 years kind of time span a lot of fdi investment from foreign companies a lot of investment from indian companies is going to come in and i think that is definitely bound to you know uh, obviously facilitate more and more technology more and more new products in the market and obviously you know people have to see pli has a long term uh, kind of investment it is not something which you invest money today and the revenue or the profits comes from the second year so in that perspective i would believe that it's still a long way before one could reasonably say that it's going to be a very positive road for all the companies opting for pli Yeah, Vinash. Thanks. So, Shashank, uh, you wanna ask anything from Vinash? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. So, yeah, you have given a very good overview about uh, almost all the sectors, uh, like uh, what's actually as is going on currently into the environment. So, my my again a question is like I would like to know your view and uh, how actually you uh, probably. look for the the, the specific stock say into a chemical or a pharmaceutical uh, as a sector because uh, here it is not a sector approach it is like a, mostly a uh, like a stock specific approach so uh, how you filter it out and what are probably your criteria as where you generally uh, look for the companies which have a potential uh, to grow uh, in future so that is that is my first question and second question is like uh, to benefit for all our audience like how one should handle the volatility in in a market uh, generally who is a who is a focused uh, small cap investor because compared to nifty uh, like the volatility into a smaller uh, company is always always higher so how one should look uh, the volatility parameter and how one should probably hedge or like um, able to uh, surpass this cycle thank you yeah i think uh, shashank thanks for the question i think the first question uh, i think you know you have a very strong expertise on pharma and chemical so you know uh, honestly i am not very good in pharma and chemical but let me tell you the approach which i take uh, basically see i look at the company's product and as i told you in my initial kind of uh, remarks that uh, there are many companies which make import substitute products and these products are basically game changers and this uh, you know product strategy actually works out very well for companies because these are not sector kind of companies these are companies where the entire fortunes of these companies is dependent on two or three key products which are clearly you know going to make a lot of money for them in this aspect uh, you know we looked at uh, you know deepak nitrate when it was 300 350 odd rupees uh, we luckily had some connections in the you know in the chemical market we met some dealers and then we met the company we got a sense that the phenol and the acetone opportunity was a very large opportunity obviously prices which were imported were slightly higher uh, what deepak nitrate did was that it obviously commercialized a very large unit and obviously not only reduced the prices but logistically could offer the products at a shorter notice to domestic customers now this was a very big key selling point for deepak nitrate 
now similarly you know if you look at uh, products like titanium dioxide now i just told uh, all of you what is the outlook on the paint sector now it doesn't mean that the paint sector is going to go into some sort of recession in fact the paint consumption is going to grow significantly uh, you got players like you know asian paints burger paints kansai apart from that now if you got grassy many of you got ksw which is coming up see the entire story is basically the volume of consumption is going to increase but margin pressure will be seen by these companies but the guy who makes the key raw material that is titanium dioxide is going to make a lot of money and i think uh, you know this is data which is already available to the public almost 80 to 85% of this product is imported uh, there is a huge amount of uh, supply deficit in our country and this product is definitely going to be a big game changer for a company like let's say make money organics so here also we had a very detailed discussion with the management we realized that you know in chemicals you know these guys have a very integrated structure they know exactly how to look at companies how to value you know uh, you know sick companies in fact the titanum tax had opportunity has come to them uh, you know by via uh, acquisition in the form of kilburn chemical which was a sick nclt company and located in dayaj you know where they have their existing facilities so some sort of integration some sort of logistic benefits obviously we see whenever we look at such companies and most importantly you know obviously the demand supply mechanics uh, the implications whether this product can be imported whether there is some sort of uh, you know uh, expectation that this product could be flooded by countries like china or some other country these are the kind of other checkpoints which we normally do but typically when we look at chemical companies especially when i look at chemical companies we look at some specific products for example uh, you know there is a product called tcca which you know there is only one company in india and globally about five or six companies which makes and that product is called as tcca the exact uh, terminology uh, i'm not aware but this product is basically used uh, abroad by lot of uh, you know customers basically in uh, you know chlorinated waters basically since uh, post the covid pandemic there was a lot of virus the virus kind of uh, infection for people who used to go for swimming or used to go to beaches so this uh, uh, chemical is actually used in water bodal chemicals has acquired a company abroad and it is the only company in india and possibly in the entire asia which is going to manufacture this product the potential is expected to be very strong so you know whenever uh, you obviously come to know of this kind of product categorization product uh, specialization obviously it becomes a key trigger point and i think then obviously uh, we obviously also look at the fact that how this product is scaled up in uh, you know in terms of revenue in terms of profits in terms of cash flows so obviously you know by looking at the product initially and then doing a little bit of groundwork you know and scuttlebutt by talking to people in the market we take a call because these kind of companies uh, you may not be able to identify by purely looking at their balance sheets or by looking at their annual report you need to understand their product strength you need to understand their product strategy and obviously on ground uh, you know how are these products doing because finally the end customer is the biggest you know uh, you know kind of uh, you know the proof that you know this product will continue to do well so this is the first answer to your question and secondly uh, you know you mentioned about volatility in the small cap mid cap kind of stock so i think jashank uh, i have been on the equity side and i have been known in the market for small cap and mid cap stocks so clearly these are stocks where the risk reward is very high and on the other hand when the market corrects also the drawback uh, is that the, the drawdown in these companies is also equally larger now here basically what we try to do when we look at any you know uh, company which is in the small cap or the mid cap space is that we believe that how strong is the business model what is the leverage on the balance sheet what is the sustainability of that company you know moving forward and getting into the bigger league because obviously what is small cap mid cap becomes a larger cap kind of category of company provided everything falls in place so this is a high risk strategy for investors who want to make a significantly higher kind of return as compared to the large cap stocks because today uh, all of us would agree that large cap should not deliver more than 15 16% in a year but on the other hand a small cap or a mid cap you know if its valuations are good if the growth story is good if the business model is strong if the capital allocation is right then i think you could even expect 25 30% upside year you know in a reasonably good time so i think it depends on the risk appetite of the investor but very clearly volatility in these companies is definitely going to be on the higher side because obviously here the liquidity aspect is also a issue many small cap mid cap companies have got a limited liquidity uh, you know in terms of the number of shares floating in the market and most importantly several hnis or several you know uh, you know maybe high uh, into, uh, net worth individuals are basically have uh, usually corner these kind of company so timing uh, you know these companies at the right price to enter these companies is very important if you enter the stocks at the right price and at the right entry point when the inflection point is going to happen 
i think that gives the maximum you know alpha in these companies but definitely if these companies you know uh, you know significantly go up and then somebody tries to buy them then the incremental upside is obviously limited but uh, having said that in conclusion yes the volatility will remain year, year high because unlike the large cap or the you know the medium medium cap companies here the liquidity is a major issue and the institutional investors normally don't chase these companies initially they wait for the market cap to become from a 500 crore or 1000 crore market cap to roughly 3000 or 5000 crore and that is when large investors come so i hope i have answered both these questions yeah thank you thank you very much uh thanks avinash for uh, for the great briefing you actually covered actually the entire index i think so i will leave uh, questions to come from participant on uh, sectors and company wise i just have one question and one broad comment we were talking about the pe ratio of the sector which has come down from uh, 25 plus to 19 actually uh, what has happened in last 5 7 years the index constituents have changed dramatically now we have more higher pe stock something like fncg has more weightage insurance has got weightage which was not there 5 7 years back so uh, yeah, actually comparing historically we are even deeper undervalued if you compare the historical pe ratio uh, only question i wanted to ask uh, on a broader level is uh, say 2 uh, 3 years back we used to see there was very narrow market only 10 15 stocks used to make money you see index movement uh, higher but uh, your portfolio is not performing in an equivalent manner uh but uh, post covid we saw that uh, uh, everyone was making money every stock was making money what's your view now that whether the participant uh, making is also going to be a broad base where there will be all kind of sectors and all all kind of market cap companies will make money or we can move to a narrow market where again they will move like only selected few are making most of the return while others are languishing uh just that view and then we will open uh, for sector question from participant yeah i think ravi nice question uh, my sense is that uh, you know you're right that there was a large of a large amount of domination you know before covid you know some of the heavily owned sectors were doing well and the other part of the market used to underperform but i think going forward you know now post covid what we have seen as of now is that a uh, lot of retail money has started entering the markets in fact that is the reason you know we see a lot of domestic mutual funds buying in these kind of market despite significant selling pressure from the fis so i think retail investors are definitely uh, looking at a lot of broader market companies and i think the broader market still looks pretty attractive if one takes the next 2 to 3 year kind of view because what has happened is that many companies you know have been uh, have seen a lot of operational improvement in their working a lot of operational improvement in the management bandwidth and most importantly you know i think uh, as everyone agrees that you know in the large cap category uh, you know if you look at a page industries or if you look at a mrf or you look at a bajaj finance i think these companies are all well positioned definitely they will grow but in terms of the incremental upside ravi uh, i would not be surprised that this is not a place where retail can make money and institutional uh, you know buyers whom we talk quite regularly they have also understood you know that ultimately the big money is going to be made in the mid caps and the medium size companies because that is where the growth alpha will kick in so i think you are going to see a broader participation yes but one thing is very clear that you know companies which are not very strong operationally in terms of their business model companies which don't have a very strong balance sheet companies which don't have the kind of cash flows to support their business you know these are the kind of companies which are going to be avoided i think nowadays investors have become very intelligent very well read nowadays lot of data you know in the form of inputs on television channels or maybe on whatsapp groups you know lot of people have got access to this and today i think information flows much much faster than what we think so to that extent i think you know the weaker set of companies are definitely not going to do well uh, so i think you know companies like reliance power or for that reason jp prakash jp prakash associates you know all the penny stocks which did well even during the covid years uh, i think those kind of days are completely over i think uh, an investors will have to realize that you know making money in 2022 is going to be a very big challenge because it's not going to be an easy market like the previous two years so i think you need to have a lot of patience you need to have a lot of maturity and you need to take a slightly longer term view if you want to build a wealth portfolio for you so i mean you know that's what i would think that money will be made in the medium size small cap companies but yes definitely in the larger cap you know institutions will play a bigger role and obviously uh, mid cap and small caps would first be targeted by the hnis and then obviously once market cap expansion happens then you will gradually see bigger hands coming and participating in these companies 
understood understood just a follow up you were talking about the fund coming from the mutual fund what we have seen in last 7 uh, 8 months uh, fii with you some 1 lakh 80 thousand crore which has been pumped by dii so any sense we have how much cash as a percentage of mf of equity uh, uh, mfs are sitting on or something insurance gives their data that how much of percentage allocation they have increased towards equity versus what they used to held on debt uh anything on that uh, if you have any insight to share yeah i think uh, i don't have the latest data ravi but from what i understand is that uh, you know most of the domestic mutual funds are sitting on say 15 16% of cash even as of now uh, there have been some aggressive funds who have bought in there are some funds who are sitting on uh, 15 16% of cash which is yet to be deployed so i think uh, probably you will definitely see some sort of selecting buying coming in you know as and when you know things get clearer Uh, i would believe that you know from a very near term perspective which uh, one point which i missed out telling all of you is that you know we have to be prepared for some more painful times at least for the first quarter of fy23 looking at the fourth quarter numbers you know from many companies the large companies the smaller companies one thing is very clear that top line growth has come in the margin exp- expansion has not happened in fact margin correction has uh, contraction has happened and i think that uh, you know momentum will definitely continue in the first quarter of fy uh 23 also so june quarter may not be very great from a market standpoint of view and we may see you know some kind of uh, flatness or sluggishness in the profitability trend so you know we need to keep this in mind very clear ravi before we take a call on which company we want to bet on because i think in the near term some more pain in the market could continue you know from the quarterly numbers which have you know started trickling in from fourth quarter so this is something which may not look nice and encouraging for all of us but as a reality we may have to face it and you know that reflection will probably come in the first quarter of fy20 sure 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 avinash sure, okay uh, i guess what we were discussing was uh, something around 15 16% of cash at a mutual fund and historically i think they used to be uh, lower than 10% so there are even enough ammunition from mf side uh to deploy in case we you see incremental selling coming from fii and i would like to sum up one comment which was made by avinash that uh, uh money making would be difficult what has happened then in previous cycle there was lot of uh, companies which hasn't performed well before this uh, post uh, covid era they rammed up four five x and everyone was making money but you need to see a company like an animal how they have performed in previous few beer cycle and then only you can gauge how they can perform from here so all those uh, fancy returns which was generated only in last two years you need to see those companies how they have performed for for a longer time cycle and then you can take your call we can open uh, floor for qna i guess uh, there are lots of there are lots of people here so guys uh, we are open uh, opening this floor for questions so we already have two speakers with us we'll be taking one by one and those who have any queries uh, they can send their request we'll take uh, one by one and uh, guys uh, those who are enjoying this uh, very educational session uh, i would request them to check the handles of the panelist and uh, definitely it is going to add value uh, to your investing journey and uh, do show over your love and uh, do share your feedback so with this uh, balendru uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question yeah so we have mukesh uh, with us mukesh ji unmute yourself and ask your question yeah can you hear me yes yes yeah good evening uh, she uh, i am question from my investors among the adani and among the adani and uh, among the we say ambani group where one aggressive investor can bait on for the uh, long term purpose so if you can yeah. throw some light on that that is number 1 number 2 what is your view on psu segment particularly uh, psu banking and psu segment thank you yeah i think uh, i'll take the second question first because i think it's little easy to answer that so as far as the psu space is concerned uh, Uh, mukesh ji i can tell you one thing that the psu banks have become extremely stronger in the last uh, you know one to two years post covid and i think if uh, a classic example is a bank like state bank of india i think classic uh, example that you know after a very long period asset quality issues are long now way behind them uh, the kind of credit growth cycle which is expected to come in the next couple of years you know double digit credit growth cycle is definitely going to uh, 
uh, ensure that you know their asset quality remains intact their loan book grows at a very strong pace and i think the markets will definitely reward them with a bigger price to book multiple currently you know the price to book multiple is nowhere compared to the private sector banks like an axis bank or maybe an icici bank so typically a lot of re-rating will come in uh, i would be a little skeptical on the smaller psu banks because here the bigger issue is on the management uh, you know in most of the banks the most important thing is the guy who actually drives uh, you know the leadership team in the bank uh, if the leadership team is driven by somebody who is not uh, you know uh, very much uh, favored by the market by the analyst community i think and the numbers don't come out to be great and i think you may not find a lot of value there but given the fact that you know these banks are large enough i think you know banks like uh, maybe a bank of baroda or maybe a canara bank or a indian bank these could be good investment choices provided you have a view point of at least 2 to 3 years but i think uh, one thing is very clear that you know uh, these banks are dominated by government uh, you know kind of initiative so tomorrow if there is some loan mela or there is some uh, kind of uh, political kind of uh, you know uh, you know uh, you know announcement made for these banks then it could obviously affect their balance sheets but these are old days i think going forward even the uh, government is aware that you know they would not like to uh, obviously take some arbitrary decisions for these banks as far as the other manufacturing businesses are concerned there is a lot of value you know in uh, railway infrastructure stocks there is a lot of value uh, in uh, basically you know uh, you know the building product segment uh, real estate segment where you know these government companies operate i think very clearly you know we have seen that even lic which got listed you know got listed at a discount to the market price to the ipo price so i think markets obviously give a longer time for you know psu managements to actually take off uh, most people expect these companies to be slow movers unlike the private sector players which are more aggressive so i think unless you have a very uh, very low risk appetite in the market then only i think you should allocate a large amount of your money in psu companies uh maybe out of a you know 100 rupee maybe not more than 15 20 rupees but the rest of the money should be allocated to the private sector kind of companies across banking uh, financials or for that reason manufacturing companies because my sense is that real money would be made by the private sector guys i mean the psu uh, companies have not made money for investors in the last 10 years and i think nothing is going to change dramatically going forward so you know that is something which uh, you must keep in mind that if you want to make a bigger risk uh, a risk reward then i think you must uh, have private sector more in your portfolio psus will make money but they won't make that kind of money which you know private sector has the potential to do so okay. and uh, okay. your first question on adani see frankly uh, i am not so uh, you know knowledgeable to talk about adani group companies uh, my sense is that adani group companies uh, frankly do not have the kind of uh, you know cash flow generation capacity because a large part of their business is generated by debt you know uh, from what i've been reading on the internet plus what i've been reading you know from research reports is that you know this group is sitting on a 2 trillion kind of debt and uh, you know the latest acquisition you know of wholesale for both uh, ambuja as well as for acc has also been financed by debt so i think you know uh, one must not forget the fact that debt is a two way kind of uh, you know sword it works beautifully in a bull market when everything is going perfectly well but when things go wrong i think the debt on the books is something which will actually be a kind of a very big uh, kind of negative for this group so my sense is that uh, you know one should not make comparison between adani and uh, you know reliance that is mukesh ambani because see, clearly if one sees both these groups one thing is very clear reliance is a company which is net uh, you know uh, net cash positive and most importantly uh, it is following a proper proper strategy a proper process unlike you know, mr adani you know where we keep hearing acquisitions you know every second month and overall i think you know this has been a stock which has been favored largely by the trader community if you look at the fundamentals of all these companies except adani ports i think all the remaining companies seem to be extremely overvalued and uh, i would personally not buy these companies so you know unless you are a very high risk appetite investor who probably would like to you know take a very high risk this is not meant for you know steady as well as you know long term investors because clearly debt is something which makes me uncomfortable so you know that is my answer to this question avinash one follow up on this say for ambani companies do you see uh, say sense of possibility that since uh, startup funding are drying up say many of the startup companies next year will be available on the block and um, ambani can pick them uh, choose them for a dime for a dollar uh, those kind of acquisition he will do bolt on uh, so opportunity because what we have seen he has done tremendous kind of acquisition on the uh, new tech companies recently and now since funding goes dry for startup 
he will have plethora of opportunity to acquire something business which has been there for three four years and now available dirt cheap. Any sense? Any possibility of that might come in next two years? Yeah, I think Ravi, very good question, and I think uh, you're right in saying that you know Mukesh Ambani has always been a very aggressive buyer of uh, good companies at distressed valuations. And I think uh, you know, looking at the kind of situation in some of the startup companies, you know, where cash has completely gone dry, uh, they don't have uh, money, you know, the the, uh, the cash flow in the business to operate their businesses. I think would definitely become potential targets. Now, which companies and which segments, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Ambani would target is difficult to point. But my guess is that you know there is definitely a concerted strategy where uh, new age companies, internet driven companies are definitely are on their radar. And uh, since they have a very large M and A team, I think Ravi, this is definitely a matter of fact that maybe the next one or two years you could see a lot of acquisitions coming out. And obviously, that is definitely with a very well concerted strategy that uh, you know data is going to be the new uh, oil in future. And obviously, all internet related businesses are going to make a lot of money provided. You know their cash burn and their cash flows are initially taken care of by a large parent. So you know this point is definitely uh, very likely that this may happen. But with what propensity it happens and which companies are taken over, we'll have to wait and watch. Sure, sir. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, we can yeah, take a uh, question. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Avinashi, a question here tha, like uh, in this downfall, whatever we have seen in this uh, uh, this turmoil from like past eight months, uh, there have been a lot of mid cap IT companies. Those might look attractive. Uh, those might generate uh, like twenty to twenty five percent of biz- uh, revenues. But what is the business? What are the what are the things we should look in companies? For example, let's say we should look for companies who are more into uh, like a tableau digital in, uh, digital integration or cloud infrastructure management what are you seeing uh, is the more revenue generation or a kind of uh, trigger that uh, an investor should look into these companies because they're actually coming at a very good uh, discount rate uh, at these times so what should be the key thing that we one uh, one inv- investor should look into this yeah i think uh, you know i think first of all uh, one should understand what are the key challenges for most of the large as well as the mid size it companies and that is basically uh, the cost of employees i think attrition levels have reached record levels uh, and i was just talking to a friend in tcs just a couple of weeks back he told me that the attrition level will get further accelerated in the first quarter of fy23 also so you know larger companies are seeing a lot of key employees exiting joining startup companies getting very fancy salaries although this may not continue for long but then in the very short term what is going to happen is that you know larger companies can still afford to buy an a expensive or a costlier guy and replace the old employee in case of mid cap and the smaller companies it's little difficult because you know obviously their margins and their profitability in absolute terms are not as large as companies like say a tcs or a infosys or a hcl tech so your point of uh, saying that whether it companies are good investments you know they are available at attractive valuations Uh, my sense is that uh, you know maybe for another quarter or so at least till the june quarter does not get over uh, in mid cap it companies i think this would not be a right time to put uh, incremental money i think it's better to wait and watch for some time because uh, you know attrition is one uh, aspect which has uh, now uh, been uh, faced by most of the it companies in a very significant manner in fact uh, post covid what has happened is digital you know cloud or for that is an artificial intelligence machine learning these are all areas where there's a lot of demand for such kind of professionals and obviously companies operating in these areas are obviously making a lot of money but on the other hand they have to obviously pay fancy salaries to their employees so that you know these employees stick with them and deliver on the projects as far as the traditional it companies are concerned like a tcs or a infosys or a hcl tech there i would expect that the cash flows are more steady in nature and obviously there the vulnerability to the attrition is you know is taken up is taken care of by the volume of business they generate so i would believe that you know whenever you look at any mid cap it companies please look at what are the business verticals the company is into secondly what has been the attrition rate in the last say 3 to 4 quarters and most importantly what is the demand outlook you know suggested by the company i mean most of the company conference calls or the investor presentations give you a fair amount of assessment on that and after that one has to take a calculated call whether one has to invest in these companies again from a medium to long term angle because as the markets are volatile you know if the uh, 
uh, uh, you know the attrition level increases significantly for the next say 3 to 6 months uh, you are going to see margins coming under pressure you know uh, companies like infosys saw an attrition level of almost 27% so mid cap companies could even face higher levels so you know that is probably the biggest challenge for these uh, mid cap it companies so i think no need to hurry i mean these are definitely good businesses but as of now i would be a little skeptical in putting my money immediately i would prefer to wait for the june quarter uh, let the june commentary come out and the attrition level be known to everybody because only and only when you are sure then you can invest in such companies because here the alpha generation is good but the risk capacity also has to be there you know these companies can correct also by 25 30% and that remains a major risk for most of these investors who prefer to buy such companies So, uh, just, so one just one question, question in addition to that. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Punit, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, just one question in addition to that. So, um, in that sense, uh, let's say you are saying uh, we should wait for another quarter to see what uh, the proceedings are, what what the commentaries of the different managements are. It's better to look at the. traditional companies like uh, the bigger ones uh, like tcs infosys or there are there is like uh, a scope of uh, seeing these companies mid cap it companies because the big daddies won't make uh, much alpha uh, for the retail investor yeah i think you must understand one thing that if you have the capacity to take a bigger draw down in your portfolio then you can even think of buying these stocks even as of you know current level because they have corrected significantly but if it all some further negative news flow comes in then mentally you have to be ready for a drawback like another 15 20% if these companies uh, go down then you need to have the maturity and the conviction to hang on here that is very important like today tcs is down to 31 3200 i won't be surprised that maybe around 3000 or 2900 it could add best correct but you know one, one is not sure as to what could be the extent of correction but especially in large cap companies the course correction could be significantly lower compared to a mid cap it company So it all depends on your risk appetite. See, basically, we are saying the long-term story is intact. These companies are earning dollars. Uh, these companies have got reasonable cash on the books. But if you are expecting the alpha to come in in the next three months or six months, that is something which is really something which is very difficult to believe. So you have got to take a twelve to fifteen month time frame. And obviously, rather than buying in lump sum, you know, buy small quantities whenever the market corrects. So that ensures that you know your capital is correctly allocated, and you probably get the best price when you look at your average cost for such companies. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Good evening, sir. Sir, can we have your view on InfoEdge? I think uh, InfoEdge. You know, if you ask me honestly, uh, when the Zomato IPO came, it was uh, considered to be one of the prized uh, kind of uh, you know companies because Zomato was one of the companies where InfoEdge had invested a lot of money. but my guess is that uh, you know clearly looking at the kind of structure of zomato as of now you know the stock has gone up because the management gave some positive commentary that they would soon be profitable but unfortunately you know they seem to be burning a lot of cash and i think uh, you know if you look at this business uh, this business may look very attractive but unless it generates uh, real operating ebitda operating cash flow and obviously it you know uh, you know it really generates value for the shareholders we are not going to see a very big upside so now uh, InfoEdge is largely a holding company. It has been nurturing a lot of these startups, a lot of these digital companies, uh, including Zomato. So my sense is, unless you have got a two to three year kind of time frame, InfoEdge is not a company which is cheap on any grounds uh, based on price to earning multiples or EV to EBITDA. On both these parameters, it seems to be richly valued. So my guess is that despite the fact that it's a uniquely positioned business, it's a uniquely positioned uh, set of companies, you know, which includes real estate, you know, basically Nokri dot com. which are all very unique and strong properties real money will be made only if you hold on for the next say 3 to 4 years so you know it's your call i mean whether you want to stay invested for the next 3 to 4 years but valuations are definitely not cheap by any standards okay i hope uh, this answered his question so vinash uh, i would like to take uh, a moment to ask you you should uh, tell the audiences about your uh, fundamental mentorship program so that they'll be they are well aware and they can uh, reach out through your handle or maybe yeah yeah sure i think uh, thanks for that so now uh, just to inform all of you we run a fundamental mentorship program uh, we have a basic level uh, you know and an advanced level the basic level is actually meant for guys who are new to the capital markets uh, we basically ensure that you know we have several 
uh, you know uh, question answer sessions in the you know in the program where you know once the session concludes we explain a particular concept we have a proper uh, 35 40 minutes q and a session with all the participants so that you know it helps the session to become very interactive and what we try to do in this basic program is that we actually take the entire journey from a company uh, to how valuations are looked upon then what are the things you should see in the balance sheet what are the things you should see in the cash flow what are the mistakes you should not commit how companies commit fraud so basically the basic program is a very basic oriented program for investors who want to make their first journey in capital market and people who want to build a wealth well portfolio on their own so the people who don't want to go to an advisor but want to invest on their own should definitely first try to educate themselves uh, as far as the advanced program is concerned we try to bring a lot of practical examples and and cover various sectors like about 10 to 12 sectors and we discuss very uh, important metrics like what is operating leverage what is the benefit of uh, sector you know turnarounds how sectors are selected what are the turnaround signs in any particular company and basically how wealth is made you know by investing in the right sector at the right time so uh, this is also a three month kind of program uh, i would suggest you know if anybody is interested they can uh, you know tweet me i can send them the entire you know uh, content schedule what we teach in the basic and the advanced program uh, by which all of you can understand you know how detailed this uh, you know program is and all these uh, videos are shared by us we have a website by the name of avinash mentor where all these recordings are available to all the paid participants so you know any time you want to have a look or revise any concept you all are free to do it so basically it's an interactive live program as well as a recorded kind of version is provided to the participants uh, thanks avinash for that update uh, we can take a question from abdul i guess he has his hand up for a very long time abdul go ahead unmute more unmute yourself uh thank you for entertaining the question can you hear me yeah yeah go ahead yeah so i just wanted to your take on the global macro environment at the moment so oil and the usd has always have a negative correlation but this time we see a very unusual thing that we have higher uh, usd due to interest rate increases by the fed and a higher oil price so what is your view on global growth and how it would be affected due to the rise in interest rates by the central banks that we've been seeing all around the world and we are also seeing a rotation and change in allocation from growth companies to value companies and basically fixed income instruments uh, we've we've been seeing that for the past two months so what is your take on global growth <coughs> and uh, the change in asset allocation uh, in the western developed equities yeah thank you for that question see first of all i would believe that global uh, equities are going to see some sort of a demand contraction and i think uh, recently the us gdp data had come in which clearly hinted that uh, there was some resistance in terms of the us gdp growth rate was concerned and as you rightly mentioned that uh, you know us is now experiencing high interest rates in fact uh, the fed has clearly mentioned that uh, their first priority is to bring down inflation which has touched record high levels and that is one uh, aspect which has hurt you know the, the currency in fact the dollar has appreciated uh, the indian rupee has uh, depreciated so my sense is that uh, you know as long as the crude oil prices remain firm uh, interest rates remain up it's going to be a very big challenge for the us economy because uh, this is going to hurt the profitability of companies here uh, more importantly the new age companies you know what has been very disturbing is that companies like netflix companies like amazon companies like uh, google i think uh, we've seen a very deep correction you know in these companies you know which were considered to be uh, basically very strong on the earnings growth side and which were completely non affected by macro economic factors but even here we have seen that numbers have been pretty weak i think the guidance given by these companies is also very cautious so i think going forward the next 3 months at least the next 3 to 6 months is going to be very uh, you know volatile very challenging and the kind of moment we have seen in the dow in the nasdaq clearly points out that we could see lot of volatility in the days to come now as far as uh, you know how this is going to impact uh, you know the equation for most of the emerging markets is that uh, these uh, you know fis who have invested uh, basically from us and from europe a lot of money shift is going to happen uh, you know from emerging markets money is going to flow back uh, on the us uh, you know debt side where interest rates have gone up yields have gone up and where i think the now the new appetite for investors here is to play on the debt market which is consistently uh giving better returns in terms of uh, you know uh, the m to m's as well as uh, basically a more safer kind of haven as compared to the equity return so compared to last two years i think uh, us equities could definitely be in for a rough kind of patch 
uh, how the economy takes off, how the interest rates actually manage to bring down inflation is something like a challenge. And even as of now, it's very difficult to visualize whether inflation will come down only by increasing interest rates. So I would believe that you know it's going to be a matter of at least two to three months before we see some conclusive data points. Till that time, I think uh, as long as the U.S. market fluctuates, that is going to have an impact on all the emerging markets like India as well as China, and you know probably that is definitely not a good sign. So in that perspective, the rest of 2022 is going to be pretty challenging. So you know these are my comments for your question. Avinash, if you allow, I would like to add something here. A uh, few things, uh, like you were asking about uh, uh, bond yields and equities. Uh, there was some report from uh, GS few months back. They were saying in last 40 years, there were only three years when debt and equity both underperformed simultaneously that there were negative return for bond holders and equity holders in the same year. So only three years in last 40 years it has happened. Now this is year till date FI uh, CY 2022. Again, we are seeing drawdown on bond and equity both. Whenever this has happened earlier, the next subsequent two, three years, more equity shareholder has outperformed the market from their historical benchmark. The second thing you were talking about the relation between bond and USD. One thing we need to understand right now what is happening in the market. Whenever there would be any kind of crisis which comes in the market, global crisis, only thing we have to uh, go back to fall on is US dollar. So that is one house. If that is kept, kept safe, then the capital market sanctity will be safe. So whenever you see any kind of crisis, you will see appreciation in US dollar. Even if you remember 2008, the, the problem started from USD, but yeah, uh, US, but it was US dollar which had appreciated against the emerging market countries. So again, the similar trend will happen. If you see the problem on the global economics as com countries are looking inward, you will see fund flow which will which can move from other emerging markets or even for that matter developed market to US dollar side. Uh, regarding correlation with uh, oil, I guess both are a bit different this time because oil is driven more because of war and dollar is more because of uh, tightening in the US. One thing I would like to add here is something like we were for 0 to 0.5 percent uh, US interest rate for at least two, three years, right? And if the journey of normalization is towards 4% from 0 or 0.5% to 4%, we have already traversed some 75% of that journey. We are already at 2.7, 2 2.8, 10-year uh, yield curve. So maximum time you pain, you bear when you are transversing that initial phase of the journey. Now, it doesn't matter. if we, It matters a lot to bondholders that we may might move from 2.8% to 3.5%, 4%. But we have already covered 70-80% of that journey. So incremental pain which can come if there is no incremental shock on inflation should be limited. And if you are not, one thing is there, you were talking about value and growth stocks. What used to happen when you are in an ultra low interest rate, whatever small cash flow you generate, you discount it at a very low discounting rate and hence the present value of your terminal value, present value comes up here very large. So that was the reason when no cash flow, low cash flow generating companies were valued very premium. Now you are entering into a phase where interest rate is very high, borrowing and refinancing is becoming difficult. So putting any industrial kind of plant, say a power plant, a industrial unit is becoming more and more expensive. And if those plant doesn't come according to the growth of the GDP of this country, what happens is the incumbent player becomes a more higher bargaining power. That's why we see the value is migrating from those value stocks to the, uh, sorry, from growth stock to value stock. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Ravi. And uh, Ronak has been waiting for long. So, Ronak, you can unmute yourself and ask question from Avinash ji. Uh, Avinash ji, thank you so much for uh, replying to all the questions at uh, in such an elaborative manner. So, in your opening remark, you mentioned that uh, there seems to be a bit of value in uh, banking sector, not only in PSU, but even in the private mid-cap banking sector. So, in that, there are a lot of banks which are quoting at, in fact, half the book value. And uh, so, one would kind of uh, think on that, uh, like, how do we evaluate the asset quality of such books, even though they are trading at half the book value, but it, at least for the past couple of quarters, the trend has been such that there is, uh, in fact, more recoveries than the provisioning. So, uh, how do we evaluate the asset qualities for the mid and small cap uh, banks? 
yeah i think uh, very good question ronak but uh, let me tell you that there is no uh, easy formula for doing this i think uh, you need to talk to the company management every quarter you need to attend the company conference calls and i think uh, you know the problem with the bank balance sheets is that only the bank knows what is the bad assets on their books unlike manufacturing companies where you can go and meet the dealer you can go and meet the customer you can get a lot of information on ground but unlike banks you know you have to wait for the bank to report its uh, you know asset quality after every quarter so most importantly you know i think uh, you have to take a reasonable amount of uh, risk reward bet when you look at the smaller banks i think classic examples have been banks like uh, dcb or for that reason catholic syrian bank you know these banks are trading at very attractive price to book multiples but clearly you know their balance sheets are small their book size is low and obviously uh, you know if they come across any bad asset it could obviously hurt their bank you know books significantly unlike you know if you compare it to a axis bank or maybe an icici bank uh, these are large balance sheets you know where even a small one or two you know kind of uh, bad account even if it does happen it is not going to upset the momentum in the business uh, clearly i would believe that you know uh, leaving apart you know banks like yes bank which are completely you know saddled with lot of asset quality issues almost 13 14% is the asset quality there i would believe that you know i think as a benchmark i think you know as long as the asset quality is between anywhere between 3 to 4% at the gross level i think such kind of banks you can take a reasonable bet and uh, frankly in a interest rate cycle upturn and an economy kind of upturn obviously what you will find is not only the bigger banks but even the medium size and the smaller banks will also start making money but obviously you got to understand what is the business mix of that bank uh, does it have a significant amount of fee income does it have a large part of only the core net interest income coming from the uh, you know the core banking business so i think uh, all said and done more than the price to book i think uh, you know particular parameters like the cost to income uh, ratio if it is reasonable or maybe you know if you find that the uh, you know the roe uh, or the roe is very decent like any bank which has got an roe in excess of 14 15% uh, roe of at least uh, you know 1.5 uh, 2% uh, consistently for the last say 2 to 3 years i think these could be good defensive kind of uh, bets in the smaller bank category and i think most importantly focus on certain product categories like catholic syrian bank i was told that they have now entered the gold financing market in a big way and they are one of the largest gold financing banking uh, you know companies in uh, basically in south so i think you know apart from the bigger you know uh, you know players like muttoot and mannapuram they have managed to now garner a large share in the gold financing business which obviously gives them a better roe which gives them a better yield so whenever you look at any bank please look at what is the composition of revenue and whether that revenue is uh, you know sustainable going forward and most importantly you need to have a regular interaction with the banks because see unless you uh, interact with the banks both uh, on a primary level and on a secondary level via the conference calls analyst meets by looking at their presentations by reading their conference call transcript it's not easy for anybody to actually pick and choose the smaller or the larger bank so i think a lot of uh, inputs actually come from the management which i think you need to do uh, diligently if you want to you know invest in such kind of stuff Sir, I, have Sir, I, have a, I have a follow up question on this do you segregate among banks uh, something like bank, uh, private banks which have a growth engine of insurance emc which are the sectors which will look down for next 20 years compared to some of the plain vanilla banks where we only do uh, banking which is more or less of a commodity so any distinction which you can make of these two categories even among the private banks and how should we va- value these companies when they are coming with embedded growth option for next 20 years yeah i think uh, another good question from your side but i think this definitely is very important in today's business environment because see when you buy a bank today i think uh, the traditional core banking business is something which is not going to drive uh, you know valuations uh, to a significant extent what the market is also looking at is that uh, does the bank have a decent exposure in insurance in the mutual fund business in the broking business so i think uh, obviously a package of all these uh, elements if it is there in any particular bank either whether it is a private sector bank or a psu bank definitely adds a little more stability and you know growth uh, potential to such kind of banks so i think you know classic examples could be icici bank or for that reason something like an sbi you know which is very cleverly positioned their presence across various uh, multiple kind of uh, you know sector engines and i think uh, insurance is one sector where you know my sense is that it's a very closed club kind of uh, you know position for most of the players there 
it takes a lot of time for any new player to you know break even and then start making money so clearly you know banks which have got a large exposure on the insurance side on the capital market side on the investment banking side on the broking side are obviously better positioned as compared to the plain vanilla banks and i think you know whenever you look at any bank i think you need to keep this factor in mind that apart from the normal core banking business do they have uh, investments in you know subsidiaries which could add a lot of value i mean clearly if you look at sbi uh, they have sbi life they have got sbi cards now sbi is planning to take their uh, amc public very soon so that also obviously will unlock a lot of value for them and most importantly you know what is the level of penetration with the retail uh, you know uh, you know mass audience like most of these larger banks enjoy a very large casa so obviously whenever you look at any bank i think the presence of a very large strong casa is something which is very important for any one of us because that gives us a feeling that funding for these banks is going to come at very competitive rates where obviously they can make a better yield in a rising interest rate scenario so i think ravi these things have to be looked upon as a prima facie must if you want to build a portfolio of banking stocks yeah thanks avinash so avinash do you have any view on uh, city union bank yeah i think see numbers have come out pretty well in fact uh, you know if you look at the loan book growth the asset quality the profitability i think definitely it looks interesting and i think you know this is one bank where possibly you know everything seems to be uh, growing pretty steadily uh hopefully you know in the interest rate cycle if they manage their risk better and if uh, you know the balance sheet increases but at the same time uh, their loan recovery mechanism is more or less geared up properly then i think you could definitely see a lot of uh, good amount of uh, value buying coming in here but yes again from a uh, longer term perspective maybe in the near term you know unless and until this bank actually uh, shows a very large balance sheet none of the larger funds or larger fis would be keen to enter this so it's going to be largely be an hni or a retail kind of story here but since uh, definitely if somebody were to look at it from a 2 to 3 year kind of time frame then definitely city union bank has been showing very decent numbers and i think uh, at some point of time you know valuations would catch up but uh, initially i think you know my pre- preference will be on the on the larger banks and maybe another say 10 or 15% you know if one has to allocate one could look at such kind of banks Yeah, thanks. So, Shashank, any other question from yourself? And in the meantime, Avinash, a very important thing like the behavior management in market. So, I would request you to tell the audiences how they can graduate on this front. I mean, managing their behavior in various <laughs> market situations. Yeah, yeah, I think that is very important. Uh, you know, basically, see, I think emotional management is very important. As the last time, I think I remember when Shashank had his, uh, you know, Twitter space, he mentioned that. there were many books available by parag parekh and you know a lot of other good quality content available on behavior management so my guess is i think you know behavior management is something which all of us have to learn on their own uh, most importantly you know any investor or trader when he brings in emotions in his decisions at that point of time money making becomes extremely difficult uh, a classic example is if you have gone wrong in a particular stock for whatever reason i think it is always better to cut your loss and exit the position even if it is a investment call or a trading call unfortunately what the retail investor you know does is exactly the opposite he hangs on to that stock for number of years for number of you know you know times and then he believes that you know that stock would bounce back sooner or later so i think one has to be very clear as to what is the objective of that investment what is the risk in that investment and if it doesn't work out then i think you need to uh, you know exit that investment free that capital and move on to something else so you know we need to be flexible we need to be little mature and we need to be uh, very non emotional when we take a call as far as equity investments are concerned uh, the only thing which i would request uh, all the participants is that you know people who do trading intraday trading uh, and people who do fundamental investing these are two completely different facets so you know if tomorrow a intraday trader wants to apply the same principle in fundamental investing it will not work there are many uh, you know you know uh, traders who believe that investing based on fundamentals is also very simple and you could possibly generate very good alpha in a very short period of time maybe it was possible in the last two years when stock prices you know galloped significantly in a very short period of time but we should not be, uh, forget what happened in 2017 when there was a very big meltdown in the mid cap category of stocks so basically you know emotional mindset of the investor has got to be very strong uh, always look at a panic situation or a crisis as an opportunity in fact a lot of people tell me that uh, why uh, you know normally i get interested to sectors when they are in trouble times is because 
you know you get good quality at a very good attractive price you will never get good quality at the right price at a discounted level in a bull market and that is the biggest problem retail investors face that then they are forced to buy at any price you know the category the investment saying buying at any price has actually resulted in investors buying companies like uh, you know paytm tomato or for that reason policy bazaar because clearly only the narrative was good but the data points and the numbers which were coming from the companies were not you know uh, evoking a lot of conviction and confidence you know uh, from these companies so typically uh, if at all you want to look at uh, you know investing in the market then emotional intelligence is very important try to convert a crisis into an opportunity but provided you have got a proper game plan and you probably invest in a company which has got some growth potential and which has got a very long term kind of runway for growth so i think you know when you look at emotional intelligence you got to apply all these metrics uh, you know in a equal proportion and then take a calculated risk because in the market nothing is guaranteed and nothing is uh, you know as simple as a formula so you have to go through the process you have to fall down you have to get up and then you got to continue your journey that is how you know you can actually uh, take the help of emotional intelligence and at the same time make a decent amount of money yeah really summed up well so uh, you discussed the very important aspect and even in the beginning you have said like uh, knowing the don'ts of market is uh, more important than do- uh, knowing the do's so basically coming to risk management so how you define risk and how you advise the beginners to go about risk assessment and risk management yeah i think uh, my sense is that uh, i follow a very simple approach as far as manufacturing companies are concerned See, i always look at companies you know which are run largely by the company's profitability or their own cash accrual so any company which is uh, you know increasing debt every year i think these are the companies which i would be a little skeptical and cautious so i think the first uh, you know don'ts uh, which i think investors should follow is that please be careful of companies which are increasing their debt levels every year and most importantly companies which are not generating the kind of operating cash flow in the business See, because operating cash flow is the first uh, trigger point for any manufacturing company you know if you see a company which has got no operating cash flow then the profit and loss or the earnings which the company generates is of no value so basically companies which focus on profitability companies which focus on operating cash flows are the companies which are definitely uh, interesting and which need to be put on your radar the opposite side is companies which just generate profits but don't generate cash in the business are companies which have to be strictly avoided so the second point is please look at the operating cash flow generated in the business because that is the first critical point to evaluate the management and the business quality of a company and the third important thing is that uh, we normally avoid companies you know where promoters pledge their shares in a very large quantity except for some official reasons but otherwise pledging is one word which is not liked in the markets people always like that the promoter stock is uh, you know unpledged always and uh, normally we have seen that whenever the promoter pledging is very high such kind of stocks evoke a lot of uh, you know less confidence from the investors both from the retail as well as from the institutional community that is very important and uh, uh, finally you know just uh, to add you know we also i mean i would be little skeptical about other uh, you know management which actually are in a tearing hurry to grow a classic example has been the adani group you know where we hear acquisitions expansions happening at a very rock kind of uh, you know gathering space and uh, while this looks very good on paper you know the implementation and the execution part of it is definitely not going to be easy so i think today uh, whether we like it or not uh, all adani stocks in the last two years have given stupendous returns they have become uh, you know uh, favorites of most of the trader community but my sense is that from a fundamental perspective uh, a debt kind of funding strategy uh, in the end is not something which markets will like uh, we have seen you know examples like anil ambani who was once considered to be the blue eyed boy in the markets but once the debt bubble actually exploded you know these companies were not touched upon by anybody so i think uh, history repeats uh, itself you know and definitely uh, i'm not presuming that this will happen to adani but my sense is that debt is a very bad word and unless it is under control or maybe you know the business is generated entirely out of cash accruals i think uh, these are the things which are the first things which investors should look upon you know whether the stock is going up or down is not relevant i think what is important is that your capital must be safe in those companies so i think these are the broader points you know which i think uh, one should at least do a small cross check before investing in any of the companies they want to put yeah so true and uh, even in the case of adani is like going forward we have general elections in 2024 and any uncertain event which the public don't like can be uh, i mean 
trigger for anything which can happen so very rightly said so avinash uh, i mean any two three picks uh, for which you want to share your outlook if uh, obviously not the buy sell recommendation but uh, if you would like to in today's current situation value buy or maybe yeah, i think uh, see i think we are very positive on the ethanol sector we are very positive on uh, you know the auto component sector so i think one or two companies which we bet and which we feel you know has got a lot of value even now uh, one of the auto component companies uh, you know is a company which is into a very different product category it's called product aesthetic which is basically designing of the logo designing of the you know door handles uh, chromium plated parts on the refrigerators that is the consumer durable kind of uh, you know uh, items and that company which we visited was sjs enterprises now this is a company which has got a very small top line of on 260 270 crores but the uh, ebitda margins are in excess of 30% and the company has a cash kitty of almost 150 odd crores on the balance sheet completely debt free business our sense is that this product aesthetic business is going to grow by leaps and bounds because nowadays you know if it is two wheelers or whether it is four wheelers i think what the car manufacturers want to do is they want to provide a differentiated product uh, finally a two wheeler you know there is hardly any scope for differentiation so basically uh, such kind of product aesthetics are being increasingly being used by the uh, you know companies to actually attract the fancy of the you know customers as far as the passenger car segment is concerned this is a very large uh, business uh, abroad in europe and us in fact uh, you know this company exports almost 14% of their products to wiston which is a very well known european company uh, in auto components so my sense is that if somebody were to take a 12 to 15 month horizon the stock has corrected significantly from 430 440 level it's available below 400 now so i think this could present a very good opportunity for guys who want to compound you know at least 25 30% over the next say two years uh earnings growth as well as uh, you know multiple expansion and looking at the kind of profitable margins very difficult to find companies where ebitda margins are in excess of almost 30% so this could be an interesting opportunity and i think uh, today the turnover is about 260 270 crores in the next two years i would not be surprised if this you know reaches 500 crores so top line growth could be facilitated by good margin kind of uh, you know sustainability of 30% which i think uh, at some point of time the market would definitely give it a second look because very little competition and very strong customer base and the promoters have also got a very strong exposure here uh, and the second uh, stock which you know recently today i mean uh, a couple of days which i recommended in uh, on the one of the media channel uh, which is a distillery and a edible oil company is dcl industries now this is a company where uh, you know uh, they have 50 55% coming from edible oil another uh, 30% coming from ethanol and uh, recently in january they commissioned a 200 uh, kilo liter per uh, day you know ethanol uh, distillery in west bengal which is now running uh, almost at 70 80% utilization so our sense is that in the current year you know both these trigger points are going to help the company uh, yesterday the company uh, sorry today the company posted its numbers the revenue was about 1900 crores and the company posted a profit after tax of 85 crores uh leading to an earnings of almost 35 rupees so i think you know in terms of the valuation comfort uh if one were to look at next year as well as fy24 earnings uh, we would not be surprised that this could be a 2500 crore top line company comfortably in the next say you know 12 to 18 months and quite frankly the earnings growth is going to be significantly good i mean uh, this year earnings growth was in excess of 20 25% in the next two years earnings growth is going to take off and ethanol as a story is not going to go out of fashion Uh, ethanol is definitely going to sell very well for the company and uh, edible oil uh, you know prices have also you know positively uh, you know improved so that also is going to actually improve the cash flows for the company so in that perspective uh, you're getting a stock at a multiple of less than 10 times where the earnings growth visibility is at least 20% plus for the next two years so here also i think uh, you know the stock has corrected from 650 odd levels to levels below 400 rupees i think here also i think one can decently Uh, you know obviously expect this kind of upside in the very near term so these are basically stocks which could give you a very good alpha over the next say you know 12 to 18 months provided the market sentiment settles down and i think uh, normalcy kicks in but definitely in terms of valuation comfort the risk reward is in the favor of the investors yeah thanks for sharing your outlook about those so guys i once again request the audiences kindly check the handles of the panelist and avinash sir has over 3 decades of experience and he's been into mentoring since long 
and as you can see from last one and a half hour uh, we are uh, listening to his insights uh, gained over three decades so guys kindly check the handles to follow us so that we can uh, come up uh, with more such educational spaces and you people can enjoy and uh, every word said has relevance so everyone is requested to do their due diligence so ravi uh, sashank any questions from uh, vinash ji and uh, or audiences if you are left with any questions you may also send up your request no i guess we have covered lots of stuff and i would sincerely uh, thanks avinash ji for having such uh, enriching and insightful session for us so uh, avinash sir like uh, seeing the current market situation we saw like the sugar companies and other i mean uh, of course so all the sectors have got the beating but uh, specifically the metals and uh, the sugar sectors has uh, bear the i mean they have been beaten badly so is it short term pain or how you see going forward i mean no i think uh, as far as uh, sugar is concerned i think it definitely is short term pain because as i told you now the focus of most sugar companies is on you know making ethanol which is going to be more profitable than selling sugar and uh, see the sugar uh, business is also obviously not uh, you know very badly impacted in fact the export uh, quota has not been completely uh, disqualified what has happened is there has been a limit of 10 billion tons which has been announced by the government so i think this is going to happen from the from the new sugar season so obviously you know that is definitely going to impact the profitability of some of the sugar companies because sugar exports fetch a better realization but if you were to look at their ethanol kind of contribution i think most of the sugar companies you know the larger ones like balrampur chini or dalmia uh, you know sugar i mean all these companies have got large ethanol capacities and i think uh, you know you need to be very clear on the fact that ethanol is one clear secular story which is going to continue for a long time as far as metals are concerned i would not be comfortable as i mentioned earlier also that you know the indications which are being given by the companies is that metal prices are not going up they are stagnating and uh, obviously uh, inflation has obviously impacted demand for steel also so i think it's not that you know metal sector demand is uh, not vulnerable uh, most importantly despite the fact that you know infrastructure you know is going to kick off in india in a very big way a lot of uh, investments have been announced by the government i think what is important for metals is that if global prices don't improve and global prices correct then i think you are going to see a repercussion of that on the domestic players and i think most of the steel companies have generated humongous returns in the last two years so now incremental upside is going to be very difficult so you know in that perspective i would believe that one needs to be cautious if somebody has made 3x 4x money in metal companies please book some money on the table and keep some cash ready because you know once the fall comes the fall will come at a very significant pace and at that point of time it would be very difficult for investors to actually exit you know those kind of positions so when we talk about ethanol one name comes to my mind so paraj industries so what would be your route look on paraj industries sir see i think uh, you know the company had its conference call now one thing which was very visible is that they are sitting on a record order book and uh, paraj is one company which is not depending only on the indian ethanol market in fact uh, they have been working on several r&d projects one of them is cbm that is compressed biogas Uh, the second project is uh, special aviation fuel which is called sap now these are all future generation kind of uh, you know kind of projects which have been lined up and i think my guess is that if one were to invest in praj today i think one needs to take a two to three year view because the entire growth story will not pan out in the next 12 months or 15 months uh, you are going to see a significant amount of re-rating in this company over the next say, two to three years as far as the current year business is concerned i think the company is well on track on achieving its target most importantly uh, they are looking at you know even uh, you know looking at diesel as a kind of medium for blending which is not done in india as of now the r&d work is still going on so you know this is a like a futuristic uh, kind of technology company uh, where which is very rare to find in indian capital markets and all these things may not get factored into the earnings of this company as at this point of time normally what mistake investors do is they only look at the current year's earnings and the one year forward earnings but you know these kind of projects which the company is working is going to give them a very strong runway for growth over the next say 3 to 5 years so i think you know if you want to buy this stock i think uh, take a 2 to 3 year time frame and recently you know the stock was available at 300 rupees again you know in the uh, revival in the markets a couple of days back the stock again moved up 
based on the quarter four numbers and the market sentiment but any correction here my sense is one should definitely look at it as a very strong wealth creating opportunity because over the next 2 to 3 years the profile of the products and the profile of the revenue not only from india but abroad is going to significantly change so to that point of fact it's a very strong wealth creating opportunity but provided one has the next 2 to 3 years in mind because many more things and many more technology uh, savvy kind of products are going to be launched which unfortunately you know some of the competitors would be able to take and that is the key differentiating factor for praj like you may not find a similar company like praj in the capital market for a very long time yeah right actually i, actually, I have one follow up <coughs> hello rohina ji can we uh, any view you have on balrampur since we were talking about ethanol uh, say this company is which were doing buyback every year their equity has reduced some 20% in last 4 5 years uh plus uh, their whatever i remember from their uh, earning projectile now 50% of ebitda is generated from ethanol business then rather than 50% is only which is coming from cane side so the stability of the earning which will help in terms of re rating uh plus uh, their capacity expansion i guess this year uh, 2x in ethanol side so any view on balrampur specifically no i think uh, ravi your point is right you know they have made the business more uh, you know uh, stronger and they have de risked their business as far as the sugar cane business uh, you know it was traditionally run today ethanol is going to be a massive kind of uh, earnings growth driver for them and i think if you look at this company over the next say 2 to 3 years then i think clearly it seems to have a very strong runway for growth going for it uh, most importantly you know it has shown some sort of uh, you know uh, you know shareholder rewarding kind of uh, approach by going in for a buyback and that has not only helped the company you know generate a strong earnings growth trajectory but even improved their operating metrics numbers like return on equity their roc so my sense is you know i think uh, markets will definitely take a kind of a positive kind of liking for the stock sooner or later i think this is also one stock which got corrected significantly you know when recently government announced the imposition of a export quota for sugar companies Uh, the management or uh, came on uh, television i mean on uh, some electronic uh, business channel and clearly said that you know this is something which is not so significant and is not going to impact the profitability badly so i think markets were definitely jittery but i think thereafter i think you know markets realized that the management was on a sound footing and i think there was a logical answer to you know the kind of uh, you know price fall which was you know generated in the market so i think these kind of companies ravi the only thing is one has to stay invested for a longer period of time because the ethanol story you know has been played out now for a very long time people have uh, realized that it's something which is uh, the same stuff which is being spoken by investors but if you look at the earnings growth trajectory these companies are likely to surprise significantly on the upside and that is something which the market will obviously reward by generate by you know giving them better valuations and obviously sugar companies are you know classic cyclical companies the ethanol business i believe is going to be more of a secular kind of growth business opportunity and which will obviously uh managed to give the companies a decent kind of valuation so i think net net balrampur chini also looks good there's no doubt but overall i would believe that you know uh, it's only a matter of time before we see those valuations come back and get reflected in the stock price sure sure yeah uh, uh you yeah, can you can go yeah yeah Vinash, uh, i would request uh, your opinion on piramal pel if you have any outlook or i mean the pharma and the i mean nf and bfc space yeah i think uh, my guess is that uh, piramal enterprises will see a lot of value unlocking going forward uh, first is the pharma business the management has gone on record saying that at the right valuation they would demerge the entity and i think uh, you know it would present a very special situation kind of opportunity when it is announced because we have seen in the past that nowadays in the market you know what actually works also well with investors is special situation kind of stocks where possibly a merger or a demerger is announced and i mean once the demerger is finalized uh, and the terms of uh, the share the share distribution ratio is finalized i think pharma business is something which will be definitely be looked very closely as far as the real estate uh, you know parcel is concerned as the, as far as the nbfc business parcel is concerned i think these are also pockets of opportunity uh, the real estate business is also turning around we are seeing a lot of uh, interest you know coming back in the real estate space so my sense is yes i think they are well positioned but you know as a consolidated entity i would believe that you know markets whatever valuation has been given to them 
they will wait for these trigger points to unfold like the pharma business getting pre-merged or maybe the uh, real estate parcel or maybe the financial business you know hyped off as a separate entity once these initiatives are announced i think then you could see a significant amount of re-rating and i think markets are well aware that at the right time the management will announce this so i think uh, you know one has to be a little patient here but definitely some good news should come in and i think investors should stay invested here yeah thanks uh, thanks avinash so we have one uh, speaker request with us dv you can unmute and ask your question please hello am i audible yeah so i wanted to ask about the pharma space so what are the new themes uh, Uh, in the pharma space especially if crimes area uh, i was uh, studying about uh, sinjin so is it a good stock and any other new trends in the pharma space yeah i think uh, my guess is that crimes is a well established opportunity then cdmo is a new opportunity uh, my guess is that you know uh, uh, within the pharma space i think uh, i would be also be keen to look at hospital companies you know if you were if you are looking at uh, you know companies which have recently generated quarter four numbers you know fortis has been one company where the numbers have been very very robust very strong and uh, most importantly you know as a integrated package this hospital company has done remarkably well in fact although these you know businesses are very capital intensive uh, this company that is fortis has generated a very good operating cash flow a very good revenue growth uh, most importantly you know now all the pieces of the puzzle seem to be coming off very beautifully and my sense is that even at the current levels you know pure hospital companies also could remain in focus i think other players which are doing a good job are you know uh, players like narayana uh, rudalay or for that reason uh, you know this fortis healthcare apollo hospitals also is definitely a frontline player here but i think the fourth quarter numbers which came out were slightly disappointing uh, they have also said that you know they want to get into the digital online uh, medicine space you know which obviously is going to be another growth trigger for them so my guess is that uh, you know if you are talking about companies like sinjin you know these are companies which are basically uh, companies which work at the back end of many pharma companies and most importantly uh, in the short term uh, one may not see a kind of an earnings explosion in these companies but longer term i think the opportunity for r and d the contract research in india is immense considering that the arbitrage uh, in india as well as developing countries is significant so i think sinjin will definitely continue to grow and you know say enjoy a very strong parentage of biocon uh, which has a very rich heritage of you know very new molecules which uh, company develops from a time to time basis so clearly you know if you are looking at the next 2 to 3 years then i think sinjin can definitely be a very good wealth promising opportunity because this is not a space where uh, you know uh, you know client relationships are developed overnight it takes a lot of time before clients are very comfortable in sharing their modules or sharing their you know uh, yeah, products with the Uh, you know with such kind of contract research companies so i think the stickiness of that clientele the stickiness of that business is very important uh, unfortunately in the markets what all of us see is immediate benefits in terms of quarterly top line quarterly profit which may not be the case of sinji but if you look at the next 2 to 3 years definitely i think this is one space which has got a significant leg up uh, to grow i think uh, you know companies like dvs or for that reason uh, you know uh, dishman carbogen which is also into the contract research opportunity they are also good companies but i think overall this space is definitely bound to grow and i think looking at the labor arbitrage which india offers i think uh, this is one space where i would like to say that you know uh, one should look at companies which have got a decent exposure in cdmo or bp contract research because these are opportunities where the margin expansion and the margin outlook continues to be quite positive unlike traditional companies you know which are in the generics or maybe in the non generic space where margins uh, are definitely you know to a large extent you know sometimes you know regulated you know by the respective government agency so i think this is one space where one can definitely look at it from a long term point of view yeah thank thank you yeah thank thank, thank, you, thank you for that so we have uh, pradeep ji with us uh, pradeep ji kindly unmute yourself and ask your question please thank you sir uh, avinash sir uh, during this recent correction energy sector has outperformed Uh, so, uh, which stock you think are better place uh, during uh, in the energy sector, and what is your opinion about NHPC specifically? Yeah, I think NHPC also will do well because in hydro power, you know, also there is a massive opportunity, and in a country like India, hydro power is a naturally generated kind of source for power generation. Uh, 
but unfortunately you know nhpc has never given the kind of shareholder returns uh, it has in the last 10 years if you see the last 10 year data point you will find that nhpc has never created wealth for the shareholder so you know that is something which is uh, definitely not uh, something which has been liked by the markets uh, uh, frankly in the in in today's scenario you know what uh, most of the market participants are liking are companies like tata power which have announced very aggressive plans in electric vehicle infrastructure solar renewable uh, another uh, you know company which is ntpc is also you know i would, would believe is a better more candidate than nhpc considering the fact that uh, you know a large part of its uh, generating capacity now some incremental capex which has happened is going to get uh, you know executed in fy23 so i would believe that uh, you know uh, rather than nhpc it would be a better choice if you look at companies like tata power or maybe ntpc uh, and obviously you know power distribution setup like even rec rec uh, you know the company generates a very steady cash flow and a very profitable power financing business uh, they paid a dividend of almost 15 rupees uh, on a earnings of almost 50 rupees so i think not only the growth but even the dividend yields would definitely look very attractive at these levels so i think you need to have a combination of such kind of stocks in your portfolio because power uh, is definitely a sector which is now uh, geared, very geared up for stronger growth in the next 2 to 3 years and unfortunately or fortunately what has happened is supply side you know dynamics are in favor of the sector very little expansion has happened for all these power generating companies and demand has grown steadily year after year so that is how the demand supply equation has become favorable for these players and plus the government is now very serious in improving increasing the tariffs of these power companies you know which if it happens it definitely adds a lot of sheen and a lot of uh, you know focus and a lot of uh, you know focus drive on their cash flows because tariffs getting increased is something which is uh, which has not happened for so many years so to that extent i think you know the tailwinds for this sector are quite positive so i think you can look at all these companies and i think you can uh, possibly do a small sip in these companies if you have got a 2 to 3 year kind of time okay thank you sir we just talked about renewable sector so the targets being set by the government how realistic you think uh, are those uh, uh, achievable or uh, it's more of a narrative thing no i think see first of all in renewable the bigger players are going to be player like uh, reliance the players like adani so you know in terms of execution i think uh, my sense is that both these groups are very aggressive on execution so you know whatever capacities they have planned i think they would definitely execute it on a timely basis uh, the key question is that what is the kind of support they get from government because renewable energy on its own will not be able to survive you require a lot of incentives by the government uh, you require a lot of support from the government and to that extent uh, you know how the government actually uh, executes these kind of things is going to be very critical because see as of now uh, most of the green energy companies like adani green or for that reason you know Uh, companies like uh, typically even tata power or for that reason you know uh, the company which reliance took over i i forget the name of that company if you could help me uh, which was uh, a stand alone business but then uh, it was sterling and wilson sorry yeah so sterling and wilson now all these companies have a large business opportunity but if you were to ask me whether these companies are rightly valued i would believe that you know valuations have gone past you know basically the fair value because markets have taken green energy to a very high record level so making money in these companies would obviously depend on the kind of uh, you know entry points which investors make because this is a business which is not going to be uh, secular it is going to be it is going to see lumpy growth in one quarter it can be good in the next quarter it can be bad so next two to three years definitely look good but from a near term perspective some challenges will continue to remain so i'm pretty sure about the execution side i mean how government responds to uh, you know the the kind of incentives and concessions which these guys would require to you know be sustainable is something which is very important because clearly green energy is something uh, which you know unfortunately the solar energy is something which cannot be stored and obviously it has to be consumed also equally fast so there are many you know do's and don'ts and pluses and minuses in this sector which i think individually you know uh, one will require a little more time to understand you know which is the best company adani green if you see the way the stock has multiplied in the last 2 years unbelievable returns and virtually no correlation to the fund we were discussing about the platform companies so say for example iex so how i mean uh, the how you see on the part of entry barriers to such platform companies i mean yeah i think uh, as far as iex is concerned you know i think after the bonus issue the stock has come under pressure but my sense is that you know this is a business which is a very scalable business uh, it's a product uh, 
uh, a platform company so basically a very asset light business and i think uh, one must understand that despite the fact that two new uh, you know uh, power exchange companies have been announced by the government it would take a long time before we could see them happening uh, getting implemented and coming into the market because see frankly it's not a easy proposition to float a company to get new customers uh iex has done a lot of work and in fact iex has gone one step forward they've actually started a gas exchange and i think the benefits of that gas exchange volume are going to get reflected in fy23 quite significantly because gas also is a very large uh, kind of a product which is you know traded and obviously you know on a exchange like iex it gets uh, more of a uh, accurate value the execution time is also very less so my sense is you know this is a very steady business but uh, the negative is that you know hopefully if the government does not put some regulation on the pricing side of the power trading uh, commission or maybe the power trading kind of charges then i think it could possibly lead to a little bit of uh, uncertainty for this kind of business at least as of now you know these discussions are not yet finally uh, you know uh, you know approved and these discussions are yet being suggested whether some ceiling has to be put on power trading kind of you know companies that would definitely be like a dampener at least in the short term but definitely core demand is growing and core demand uh, is obviously going to benefit the distribution companies especially platform companies because finally this is one medium where the scalability is very large in fact in india hardly 10 15% of the power generated gets traded on these power trading platforms so there's a lot of headroom to grow only thing is i think in the very short term you know these kind of challenges would continue but in the longer term Uh, i would believe that a lot of money can still be made from a company like iix one last question from me avinash and then uh, we have already taken two hours and it was like uh, really insightful on your part uh, we didn't feel like we have been uh, listening incessantly from last two hours so guys uh, humble request kindly check the handle of avinash sir he has been uh, doing great work for the relate, uh, retail investors kindly check his handle and do show over your love do connect with the handles of the panelists so that uh, you people are notified as and when we hold such educational spaces in future and also various outlook about different sectors and uh, scripts have been shared on these handles so i request to kindly uh, follow our handles so the supply constraint which we are seeing to so how how long uh, this uh, supply demand uh, mismatch is going to stabilize i mean your view on that sir so supply demand mismatch for uh, what in particular uh, please i mean this, uh, if we say uk russia uh, uh, Ukraine Russia war is creating the commodity i mean supply side uh, issues so on that uh, aspect i'm asking yeah i think uh, you know nobody expected the russia ukraine war to continue for the third month and now uh, we are slowly approaching the fourth month uh, my sense is that you know it's very difficult to pinpoint when the russia ukraine war will get over but this is going to be a major trigger point like the day the war is uh, culminated and gets over uh you could possibly see a steep correction in crude oil prices in commodity prices and i think uh, things would gradually get normalized but i think till that time i think it's going to be a key challenge because uh, as everyone is aware U- us has imposed severe sanctions on russia and i think as i was telling earlier in my uh, you know discussion that one major issue which uh, a lot of people have not discounted is the food grain crisis you know globally food grains uh, crisis is going to be a very big issue and uh, since ukraine as well as russia are into very key raw materials and commodities uh, it is very clear that uh, you know companies which obviously uh, you know obviously are into the food grain business in facilitating the food grain production would definitely do well but as far as the supply side dynamics are concerned i would believe that maybe we are yet at least a couple of months away before we could see these supply side pressures especially for crude or commodity prices or natural gas prices to cool off and i think crude is yet showing a hardening trend which clearly shows that you know on ground things have not changed uh, you know that significantly as what has been reported in media so i think till that time uh, you know it's going to be a very uh, uh, you know very very uh, fluctuating as well as as well as a very volatile period uh, my sense is that possibly by end of july or maybe you know early july mid july i think we could see maybe this uh, you know space off between russia ukraine getting over and that point of time the market should obviously look at it very positively because you know at that point a lot of uncertainty which is prevailing in the market would come down the rupee factor would the us dollar factor the crude oil factor uh, commodity prices factor all these things would obviously tend to you know fall back and that definitely would have a soothing impact on you know the markets at least in india and i think globally also 
markets would cheer this event because this is definitely something which is uh, not good you know as long as the war continues the market would remain volatile and uncertain yeah thanks avinash so avinash uh, thank you so much for uh, today's session and i would request uh, closing remarks from your side and uh, also request you to i um, mean give a message to the retail investors who have just started uh, the basic uh, thing you want to say and after that uh, we can uh, wrap up today's space it was really insightful yeah uh, yeah i think as far as the retail investors are concerned uh, you know the guys who have entered the markets a couple of years back uh, i would uh, uh, you know encourage uh, young uh, you know investors to actually allocate a decent amount of money for basically wealth creation in a very steady and a very disciplined process oriented manner in the last two years you have seen a lot of robin hood investors who have made quick money in no time but i think going forward equity is always a long term asset class which has outperformed all other asset classes so i think you know if you have a limited capital also please start an sip either if you want to do a direct investment in equities or you want to start a mutual fund or you want to buy a, a index fund but definitely don't stay away from uh, you know equity markets don't stay away from uh, you know uh, financials uh, markets because this is one uh, market which is going to generate a significant amount of alpha in the longer term in the next 5 to 10 years uh, we can definitely you know all of us can become uh, financially independent generate a lot of wealth provided uh, you know one follows a proper system and process in place and uh, please don't get lured by you know uh, people who are there in the markets i think uh, without naming anybody uh, you know there are many many people who are there on twitter who are there on you know whatsapp groups telegram channels who put lot of uh, unsolicited you know fake data to promote their you know companies uh, you know products and services so i think please don't get carried away by these kind of uh, you know people in the market because unfortunately uh, you know uh, there is nobody in the market who actually guides the investors uh, as to what is right and what is wrong so i mean this is something which i think all of us to do their personal hygiene you know when they want to you know uh, proceed on their investment or financial kind of journey because uh, today unfortunately people get carried away by these short term kind of uh, you know inputs which come in the market from various people and that obviously leads them to you know uh, believe that everything is possible in the short term i mean i would like to repeat uh, my point which i made earlier that money making is not easy it is a very difficult process but it is very much achievable for all of us for all the retail participants if you follow a proper process and which will lead to good amount of wealth generation for all you guys in future so true avinash every word we can echo i mean last uh... see those who entered the market in bull phase are living in oblivion that uh, they have earned money by i mean hard work but they forgot the luck factor and the bull market effect so guys uh, as very rightly said by avinash ji you have to be very cautious you have to learn the nuances of market and the fundamentals of market are very important and those uh, who are new to market they should try to learn the fundamentals and basics of market if they can spare time and are intelligent enough to do it on their own they are more welcome and if they want to get mentoring on this uh, they can uh, contact avinash ji uh, through his twitter handle and uh, i can bet like uh, with uh, today's session you people are aware you people have stick to this spaces for last 2 hours so that is very i mean the interest your interest is conspicuous so i would request each and every one of you to be i mean if you are investing your hard earned money it should not be invested in anything or you should not uh, be soliciting any kind of tips over social medias so it would be wise on your part to learn the nuances of market from learned people so that you at least get a basic idea of avoiding the don'ts of market right a market a uh, is i mean if you are in market it is a never ending learning process but again those who have seen considerable time in the market they have seen cycles they have seen how the economies i mean economic cycles credit cycles uh, uh, behave so there are so many aspect to it so those who want to learn these nuances may contact avinash ji and apart from this i would uh, sincerely thank each and every audiences uh, who have stayed with us for uh, more than 2 hours 
and it was really kind of you people to show our love by connecting to our handles and it was very generous of avinash ji uh, taking all our questions uh, so humbly and he explained it uh, no better manner other person can do so it was really nice uh, hosting avinash ji and i hope uh, we can have such uh, future associations as well so that more and more retail people are getting benefited with the huge experience you carry thank you avinash ji yeah definitely i also enjoyed the session and definitely in future we'll have many more such interesting sessions you know so that uh, this will benefit everybody so guys do connect with our handles and for sure uh, you will be enjoying our future spaces as well and uh, today due to short of time we if uh, uh, any of the members we are not able to take their questions they can write uh, their questions over uh, our handles we will try to take up those questions and thanks for your patience and keep learning keep and adding value so it, it would be good to have you as a part of our twitter family do follow us thank you so much for today's spaces thank you avinash ji thank you ravindra and other panelists